Homework two is now posted. And in homework two, you're going to set up Kerbal Space Program, get the mods set up so that we can use it as a robotic simulator, and then you're supposed to launch a particular rocket into space efficiently. And not just into space, but into a circular orbit. So let me talk a little bit about what that means in Kerbal Space Program. Kerbal Space Program, you start off with your rocket on a planet called Kerbin. Uh, there's your rocket, it's pointing up, and uh, I don't know what planets look like. There's a planet. When we launch the rocket, it's going to ignite the rocket engines, and the rocket engines are going to generate uh, hot gas that goes down, and then according to Newton's laws of physics, if we have something going down, we're going to have a force in the opposite direction, and that's going to push the rocket forward. Now, what we want to do in order to get into orbit is we need to get the rocket from being on the ground standing still, we need to get it up into space going sideways. Because if it's in space, outside of the atmosphere, so we've got an atmosphere on this planet. Inside the atmosphere, if the rocket is moving, it's going to experience drag against the atmosphere, which will slow it down, eventually causing it to crash. That's not what we want from our rocket. We want it to go up into space, and we want it to be there forever. In a Kerbal Space Program, it is conceptually there forever because the atmosphere stops. On Earth, the atmosphere sort of slowly diminishes towards zero, but at a certain point we can call it zero, but it doesn't really go to zero and there's not a boundary. But if we can get the rocket into space above the atmosphere, then it's no longer experiencing drag, and if we can make it go fast enough sideways, then as the gravity of the planet is pulling the rocket down, and the sort of momentum momentum of the rocket going quickly is making it go forward, the result will be a circular orbit around the planet. It tries to fall down, it's going so fast sideways that it misses. So in order to get the rocket from being on the ground into space, we have to do two things. And if we were going to like launch a rocket in the simplest possible way, we would do these two things in order. The first thing is we need to launch the rocket up. We need to get it up high enough that it's out of the atmosphere. So in Kerbal Space Program, the height of the atmosphere is 70 kilometers. So we would ignite our rocket engines and let the rocket engines burn, pushing the rocket up until our apoapsis, or the expected point on the rocket's trajectory where its altitude will be highest, is above 70 kilometers, and then we can turn our rocket engines off and go ahead and coast. And we probably want it to make, want to make it relatively, like significantly above 70 kilometers, maybe 100 or 120 kilometers, because we want some time while we're up there. We don't just want to like peek out above the atmosphere and then immediately, immediately fall back down into the atmosphere, because then we're in the atmosphere again. So we'll burn until our apoapsis is at 150 kilometers. Well outside of the atmosphere. And then we shut off the engines and we wait for the rocket to coast. It's gonna slow down as it's going up. And then when it gets 150 kilometers, it would stop. And then it would start falling straight back down. We don't want it to stop and fall straight back down. So around when we get to 140 kilometers, we're gonna find a way to turn the rocket sideways. Turning the rocket sideways is uh, tricky in the real world. In Kerbal Space Program, there are, uh, if you just try to turn a rocket, it frequently does turn sideways depending on what actuators it has. The key actuator that lets you turn sideways in Kerbal Space Program is something called a reaction wheel that's based off turning a gyroscope and that works in the real world. It doesn't work nearly as well as it works in Kerbal Space Program, but that's fine. We'll use our reaction wheels to turn the rocket sideways, and we get up to, say, 140,000 kilometers. We're gonna turn the rocket engines back on and start burning right, uh, right in the diagram. Probably we would wanna say east, although, 
probably an even more useful thing to say would be uh, we want to go counterclockwise around the equator when viewed from the viewed looking down on the North Pole. So we're looking down on the North Pole. We're going to go counterclockwise. So that's like a positive rotation in a sort of standard engineering coordinate system. Uh, here, I guess in the picture, we are looking up from the South Pole is what's going on. Yeah, we're looking at this rocket up from the South Pole. I don't know why I drew it that way. But we get up into, we get up to close to our apoapsis, we start burning, and we're gonna burn until our um, periapsis. So we have this circle that is our predicted orbit, and we're gonna burn until the side on the, the, uh, the predicted point on the other side of the orbit is also 150 kilometers. And if we did everything right in the process, our apoapsis should have stayed about 150 kilometers. And when both the highest and lowest point that we're gonna be at in our orbit are about the same, then we're in a circular orbit and we've succeeded. There's one sort of trick here, and that is we don't know actually exactly when we have to start that burn, the, the circularization burn. We wanna start burning halfway uh, we want to start burning such that when we get to apoapsis, we will have half of our burn remaining to do. We want the like time on either side of the apoapsis of the burn to be equal. And that will tend to make everything even out, so we end up in a circular orbit. And if we want to actually calculate that, we would have to do arithmetic. We're going to have to do some arithmetic in this class, but it turns out that as we try to make things a little bit more efficient than just launching straight up, we also reduce the amount of problem we have with having to calculate exactly what we're doing with that circularization burn. So the problem with launching straight up is that one of the things that causes inefficiency is us spending time fighting gravity. If we're burning straight up, then however much, um, however much force we are exerting to try to increase our speed up is being directly countered by the 10 meters per second per second down of gravity. And so whatever we're doing, we just get to subtract 10 meters per second per second as far as uh, what benefit we're getting. And that's just a constant decrease on the efficiency of our stuff. We're, we're burning fuel just to stay up, to, to not fall down, not to go up. So the sooner we can start burning sideways, the less time we have to spend, um, we have to spend burning up. And also, the lower we can make our goal apoapsis. If we burn straight up, and when we start doing our circularization burn, we have zero horizontal velocity, then we have to get all our horizontal velocity up in space. If we start burning a little lower, and maybe try to do a curve, we can start to get some horizontal velocity as we're still climbing. The other thing that's a factor is that if we're going sideways through the atmosphere, our rocket will generate a little bit of lift as it's going over air. The air will actually push it up. And that's not a large effect but we get none of that benefit if we're just going straight up. We have to be going sideways to benefit from any lift. And Kerbal Space Program does simulate some aerodynamics, although not very well. And it may be not very well in our favor. It, it makes things generate lift that might not generate anywhere near that much lift. So what we're looking at trying to do here is try to figure out what curve do we want to do? How much do we want to tip the rocket over as we go up? in order to get an efficient launch. And one way to do that is just have some function, f of alt equals tip over factor. So we have a function of altitude that's gonna produce what angle we want the rocket to be at. And in KOS, which is what we're gonna be using to actually actuate our rocket, we can straight up set what we want our target tilt angle to be. That's one of the 
the angles of the rocket and so we can we can request an angle and the the rocket will try to get to that angle for us one sort of really simple solution here would be to make this function be uh, I can never remember whether I want sine or cosine. I'm not gonna look it up. If I'm getting my sine and cosine backwards, people who actually know math, let me know. But if we make this be, um, out over 100,000, then if I got my sine and cosine correct, then, um, Wait, am I backwards? Do I want arc sign here? Probably. Remembering that I don't know trigonometry off the top of my head at all, I still am able to get rockets to launch. But um, this is going to be out equals zero. The rocket is pointing straight up. And then when alt is 100k, the rocket's going to be pointing straight sideways. And that, that'll give us a nice sine curve that we're turning on. It's not going to be quite this like um, quarter of a circle curve that I drew there, but it's pretty similar. And yeah. That's one possibility, and that might give you a reasonably efficient launch. It might not, depending on how quickly you're burning. You may have gotten to orbital velocity when you get to 100,000 kilometers, you may have more burn to do. You may also find yourself here with an apoapsis of 100,000 kilometers, and at that point, you're, uh, you burned up too fast compared to your curve. So it's worth um, spending some effort thinking about whether it's worth doing the math. And I'd recommend trying it and see what behavior you actually get before spending a bunch of time trying to optimize um, the equations for how to get exactly the right answer for matching a specific curve. Because there's a lot of considerations and you don't necessarily have the problems that you think you do until you've tried it. But I think that's the stuff I wanted to draw on a whiteboard before homework two. So good luck playing around with launching a rocket. Good morning, and welcome to the second week of lectures for robotics. The first assignment is due uh, this week, and I want to talk a little bit about the, the final task. Most of the work for the assignment is going to be to get Gazebo up and running on your machine. I know a lot of people have had a bunch of trouble with that, but once you get Gazebo up and running, and once you get the starter code up and running, the next thing that you're going to have to do is modify the starter control program in order to be able to get your robot to drive from the starting position to the end position. In general, this sort of problem is called navigation, but for this particular assignment, we get to do this in sort of restricted, limited way, where the only thing we really have to worry about is obstacle avoidance. I wanna talk a little bit about this sort of teaching mobile robot that we're dealing with and the problem of obstacle avoidance. First thing I want to talk about is the two different configurations we're likely to run into this semester for robot movement. Robots are rectangles. They have a direction that they go in that's forward and they move generally on wheels or sometimes they move on treads. From our perspective, controlling the robot, as long as we're trying to keep it relatively simple, which we will be probably for most of the semester, there's no real difference between whether we have wheels or treads. The important question is, what, is how do we steer the robot? And there's two strategies that are common in this sort of educational setting for steering, steering a robot. The first way to steer a robot is that we can rotate the front wheels, left or right, like we would on a car, and then once we've rotated the front wheels, when we drive the robot forward, it will tend to turn in the direction that the, the wheels have been steered in. The other option, which doesn't actually require treads, but is frequently called tank drive, is that we have the ability to control the wheels on the left-hand side and the wheels on the right-hand side for speed separately. 
And usually this means that we can have the wheels on either side go either forwards or backwards at whatever speed. And by doing that, we're able to move the robot forward, forward turning, or even spin the robot in place. And being able to spin a robot in place is wildly convenient. That lets you do some, some stuff control-wise that is much more difficult to deal with when you have a robot where we can have the front wheel steer in order to turn the robot because if we're steering the front wheels to control the robot then the robot must be moving forwards or backwards in order to turn you can never just turn unfortunately for everyone the first assignment i gave you a car steer robot not a tank steer robot so that's going to make things a little bit more annoying than it otherwise would be but that's part of the fun now, in addition to the movement actuators that we have, the other thing that's important to this sort of obstacle avoidance problem is how we detect obstacles. On the starter homework, we have a LiDAR sensor. That's a little uh, like puck-shaped object that sits on top of the robot and sends out laser beams in every direction, 360 degrees. And this is how real LiDAR sensors potentially work. In fact, I probably should have gone and grabbed one so I could show you one. But in any case, um, we have this laser sensor that's going to send out lasers in every direction, and then it's going to measure how long it takes the laser to bounce back using physics trickery. Once it's measured how long it takes the laser to bounce back, it can calculate how far away the object that the laser bounced off of was. And so what we get is for every laser sort of reading that we sent out and got a result back for, we have a distance measurement. And it's a pretty accurate distance measurement for, for this sort of application. We're talking uh, half a centimeter sort of precision and accuracy as far as how far away the obstacle is. And so in one plane, the plane of the laser readings, we know pretty much exactly how far away things are from us. That's an extremely useful sensor. It's a moderately expensive sensor, so we won't always have it on, um, on real robots. But it is, a, it is the sensor that we have on the starter code. And so that's gonna give us some flexibility in figuring out where obstacles are in order to do stuff. The other possibility, so that gives us distances 360 degrees around the robot, the other possibility is something like you see on the, the Ranger robot kit. On the Ranger robot kit, it looked like this. We've got two eyes, but uh, vertically looking down, we have um, a sonar on the kit. And so it's gonna give us a moderately inaccurate uh, distance sense, uh, distance reading for the obstacle directly in front of the robot at a specific height. And it's not one specific height, it's sort of a, a cone sort of situation. Um, luckily, we don't have to model it exactly. What we're gonna do is we're going to actually, if we have to deal with a robot with that sort of sensor, like the Ranger, we're gonna have to move the robot back and forth a little bit to get multiple readings before we determine what the, the space around the robot actually looks like. But, with this sort of single sensor, we have at any given time a reading for what's directly in front of us and nothing else. So this is simpler, but this is way more useful. Once we have this data about obstacles, and once we have, um, once we know how the robot is being driven, the question is how do we avoid hitting stuff while still moving towards our goal? And that, of course, raises the next question, which is, how do we know what we're trying to do? And generally, when I'm thinking about obstacle avoidance, the thing that's the input to the object avoidance system, uh, to the object avoidance, uh, the obstacle avoidance system, is a direction that we want to go. So, sort of in general, we might have our robot. This is going to be the the car robot from the from the simulation. It's got the laser on top, and there's some fire hydrants or something. And the robot knows that it wants to go 
that way. That's its goal, is to go that way. So given that information, that this is its goal, and in the, uh, in the homework, that's gonna be its goal because the goal target, the checkerboard, is in that general direction. But it might be that we have that goal direction because of other software that knows more information about what, what we're trying to do, and it happens to have picked this direction as a sort of short-term objective that it then wants our obstacle avoidance system to deal with. In any case, the object, obstacle avoidance system now has the, the goal, it has the, the purpose, of trying to get the robot in that direction so that then we're a little bit further in that direction and we can reevaluate what we're doing. Um, we don't necessarily all at once need to figure out how to get the robot like all the way around the obstacle or all the way where we're going. If we are trying to get the robot from point A to point B through sort of arbitrary obstacles, that's not a question of obstacle avoidance, that's a question of general navigation. And the strategies for navigation are a little bit more complicated than what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> so there's two general strategies I want to, uh, like families of strategies that I want to talk about for figuring out how to do obstacle avoidance. So the first plan is to have a purely reactive, or another way to put it, is stateless control program. So in a stateless control program, the decision of what to do is a pure function in the same sense that functional programmers use. And so we're gonna take our inputs. Our inputs are goal angle and obstacle sensor reading. And for, for the the steered car robot in the, in the homework one simulation, this obstacle sensor reading is going to be an array of uh, distance angle pairs. That's what comes back from the, from, the laser, from, from the LIDAR. And so we need to take this information and convert that into what our motion output is going to be. On a tank steer robot, that would be a combination of a rotational speed and a forward speed, which would be nice and convenient. On a car steer robot, that's a combination of a turn command to the wheels, so what angle do we want the wheels to be at, and then a forward speed. It's a little bit less convenient because we can't turn the robot without putting it forward or backward. But based on this information, we can, we can pick values for those things, and we can pick values for those things that are going to accomplish a certain goal. Now, because the output that we're producing is that speed forward, and then whatever the turn mechanism is, we have to figure out how do we actually determine what we want for those values? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Obviously, the first thing that we're trying to accomplish is to make progress towards our, towards our goal, make progress in the goal direction. But there's actually a more important thing that we want to accomplish. And that is our goal number one, don't hit anything. At least don't hit anything that we didn't intend to hit. And in simulation, that's less important than it is with a physical robot. But the point of simulation is to prepare for trying to run something on a physical robot. So even in simulation, we want to try to follow that rule. And so our goal is to not hit anything. So when we're looking at a situation like this one, and in order to sort of conclude that the situation is like this one, we're going to have to do something with our sensor readings. Maybe we do some arithmetic and determine that... Um, there is an obstacle in this rectangle in front of us or something by looking at the, uh, the laser scans. But when we're in a situation like this one, we have an obstacle right in front of us. And so we have to make sure that if we're moving forward, we're turning quickly enough that we're not gonna hit the obstacle. We don't want to, we don't want to drive forward quickly straight and we don't want to turn back towards the obstacle. We want to make sure that we're turning away from the obstacle such that we'll miss it. We can do some arithmetic and some, uh, some geometry to try to figure out, given a forward speed and turn rate, are we going to hit it or miss it? And we can use that as input to what our outputs are going to be. Uh, our, our outputs are going to be speed and turn 
angle. But in a, in a purely reactive situation, we're able to just take those inputs, do some calculation, it could be arbitrarily complicated, but it's just an immediate calculation based on the inputs, and produce these two output results. So there's a bunch of possible strategies on how to do it. There's also some ways to get it wrong. For example, if we're in this situation, we could have the rule be that um, if there's no obstacle in the way, we try to steer towards the goal. If there is an obstacle in the way, we try to steer around the obstacle by steering in the direction that gets us closer to the goal. So here our goal is off to our right slightly. So we wanna turn slightly to the right. So we're gonna to try to avoid this obstacle by steering to the right and then moving forward. So we'll steer to the right and move forward a little bit. And as the result of steering to the right and moving forward a bit, we may eventually get into a situation like this. Uh, I'm gonna cheat a little bit in the example. We may eventually get into a situation like this because we've steered slightly to the right where the robot We steered slightly to the right, and the result was now that the robot is now slightly to the left, and the robot is now going to try to steer to avoid the obstacle in the direction of the goal, but it's already kind of past the obstacle in the other direction, so it's steering in the wrong direction. What it needs to do here is drive forward, but it doesn't know how it got there, so it doesn't know if it's before or after the point where that sort of correcting steering would make sense. And this example is sort of bad, so let me, uh, let me draw the picture in a way that makes my point more clearly. We're gonna make the obstacle look like this. We're gonna make the goal look like that. And we're gonna make the robot start initially like this. So the robot measures the direction to its thing and measures that steering this way is going to get it closer to the goal. So it moves slightly that way but in having moved slightly that way, it determines that moving that way will get it closer to the goal. So it moves slightly that way, slightly that way, slightly that way. And eventually it's like going to hit the wall instead of actually making any progress going around it. So that's a complication with being completely stateless is when you're trying to determine what you're doing, you don't know what your plan is. And so you have to come up with a strategy where you don't need to know what you were thinking a second ago. Another possible thing to do is if we determine that we've, we have an obstacle and we're already steering away from the obstacle in a particular direction, so we pick this way and we move a little bit, and so now we're a little bit more that way, we assume that even, that even though we, were go, we're, we appear to be going in the wrong direction to make progress towards the obstacle, the reason that we're going that way must be that that's the way that we're trying to steer around the obstacle. We can clearly see that the obstacle is in the way of going forward, so we're going to just continue the plan. So from this position, clearly we need to steer a little bit more. And then eventually we'll get to the position where we're going that way. And with a LIDAR, we can see to our right. And we can notice that we have an obstacle on our right. And so if we have an obstacle on the right, that must be because we're trying to drive around it on the left. And so when we have something on one side like that, the strategy is just to wall follow forward. And if we wall follow forward, we can reactively get to our goal. And that's actually a really good strategy here. Another strategy is the one that I used in my solution program, and that is just we always turn right. So as long as, as, long as turning right will accomplish the goal, that will work. This wall following strategy of if we have an obstacle on one side, we, we decide that we're wall following. If we have an obstacle directly in front of us, we turn, I mean, we could even flip a coin. We flip a coin to determine which way we're gonna go. And then once we've flipped the coin and gone like one tick, the next time we check, it's not going to be that we have an obstacle directly, directly in front of us. The obstacle is gonna be slightly on one side. That indicates that we've picked that side and we're gonna go ahead and wall follow in that direction. That'll actually handle relatively complicated objects. We can even have like big, um, We could even have a horseshoe wall. You have the robot in here, and if it's doing wall following, it picks a direction. Well, I don't 
know if we can turn around that quickly. But we'll end up wall following that way and we'll get out. So wall following is a good strategy and it can be done reactively. If we want to get a little bit more complicated, we can add state. We can remember what we decided. So if we want to do dodging things by remembering what we decided, we have a like single bit of memory that we're going to maintain between calls to the control program. It could be a static variable in a function or a global variable or a, a class member variable in our, in our robot state. And when we get into the situation where we don't know what we're doing, the obstacle is in the way. We can flip a coin to decide that the thing that we're doing is turning right. And then until we have no obstacle in the way, we'll just drive consistently with a plan of turning right. And then when we, have no, when we have no obstacle in the way, the thing to do if we have a direction decision and no obstacle is throw out the direction decision. So then we don't have a direction decision anymore. Or we keep right forever because then that produces the strategy that I used for my program. All right, so that's sort of broad strategies. The next sort of thing that we have to think about is how are we going to sort of decide uh, our speed and turn angle based on having seen obstacles? And the answer is that we're stuck having some sort of model of how the robot's going to turn and how the robot's going to move. We have to be able to predict what's going to happen as the result of this, these outputs so as to avoid running into stuff. Now the first thing that we can do is if we have a robot that's looking at, at a wall, we can have a rule that we aren't going to run into the wall. And what we want to do to avoid running into the wall is say that the speed that we pick is not going to result in us hitting the wall too soon. When we say too soon, it works best to think in time. We want to have the rule be that we won't set the speed such that if we stayed at that speed, we would hit the wall in the next five seconds, in the next two seconds. You have to figure out what makes sense for the thing. But that decision right there, that rule right there saying the maximum speed that we can go would cause us to hit the wall in three seconds, that can actually be pretty much directly how you set your speed. The speed is such that you won't hit a wall sooner than three seconds with a maximum speed of six meters per second. So that deals with speed. How about turning? Well, with turning, you sort of want to predict what corridor the robot's going to follow, and you want to make sure that you never hit an obstacle. And a good way to model that is rather than trying to predict actually where you're going to go, you go ahead and project a I mean, in your head when you're writing the code, not actually make a box. But you have the robot trying to turn this way, and maybe it's actually trying to turn that way. So we're gonna project out a shape, and the shape can probably be a rectangle, that is the, your estimate, a simplified estimate of where the robot is going to be over the next three seconds as the result of doing what you're telling it to do. And again, if this is going to result in the robot hitting something, you need to have a shorter box or a tiltier box. And that's a like idea of how to figure out what direction you're gonna go in. So that's me talking a lot about sort of the ideas here, but these are reasonable ways to think about the problem. I don't know that you'll need anything quite as complicated as uh, rectangle predictions for the uh, homework one, but as we move forward, you may. All right, another thing that I wanna talk about here is what we do with these obstacle avoidance systems. So when we're building a control program for like a mobile robot, it is really important that we follow that rule that we don't hit anything. So we want to have a nice, relatively simple to understand and relatively unlikely to fail and relatively computationally limited component that determines what the motor controls are going to be and make sure that you don't run into things. So having a simple 
obstacle avoidance component is valuable just from a don't break your robot perspective. A simple go towards goal, don't hit anything. And goal direction, just the direction. And in a robot that's doing navigation, maybe it's trying to solve a maze, it's useful to layer on top of this a navigation module. And in the navigation module, we can plan a path, taking into account significantly more information and doing significantly more computation than we're doing in our obstacle avoidance thing. Um, I had a robot with this design where obstacle avoidance could run 30 times per second and the navigation module would run constantly, pretty much pegging a CPU core, and it would take about five seconds to do a single iteration. Not the greatest setup, it was kind of a slow computer. There's reasons why that particular robot wasn't the best example of how to do things, but even being in a loop where it was taking five seconds to do its path planning, it was able to give the obstacle avoidance a goal direction that was sufficient to be able to allow the robot to make progress and complete the robot course it was trying to complete. And we might even have some higher level module that is feeding input into that navigation module, or we may decide that there are other pieces in the system, but it's convenient, it's important that the obstacle avoidance system has direct control over things like how fast are we gonna go, is able to see whether we're gonna hit anything, and isn't being lagged down by slow computation and other components. All right, good luck with not hitting some fire hydrants and a like little chunk of brick wall in homework one.